On September 30th, London Decca Records released their latest album from Grammy Award-winning composer Christopher Tin. For those unfamiliar with Christopher Tin, he is one of today's most innovative and influential composers. His compositions for film, video games, and the concert stage have earned him two Grammy Awards and accolades from audiences and critics throughout the world. This latest project, titled The Lost Birds, is a sweeping and gorgeous musical memorial to bird species driven to ext extinction by mankind. It's a celebration of their feathered beauty, their symbolism as messengers of hope, peace, and renewal. This is a truly exquisite CD that features two of the world's most foremost ensembles, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and the English supergroup Voces 8. Joining me here over Zoom to talk about this amazing environmental project and this recording, I am joined by the composer, Christopher Tin. Hey, Chris, good to see you again. Hey, likewise, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, I first want to say congratulations. This is a just stunner of a disc. I have to, when I come into work, it's nice. I'll turn it on, especially as the days here in Winnipeg are so short and we're looking down the barrel of winter. It's just perfect chill music. It's just beautiful. So congratulations. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time we chatted was about your oratorio, To Shiver the Sky, uh, an oratorio about the wonder of flight. And here with Lost Birds, flight plays a role, but in a very different way. With Lost Birds, we're dealing with extinction, not only of birds, but all creatures. When and how did the project come about? You know, Chris, originally my concept was to create a piece that was both about human flight and bird extinction. Originally, both of these albums were one project, but after developing them further, I realized there was too much to say on each topic that they couldn't be on the same project. So I split it into two projects. But I've been interested in bird extinctions for more than a decade now. It actually started when I scored a documentary about a sculptor named Todd McRain, who was making sculpture memorials to extinct bird species. And um, I was just so moved by his artistic process and his story that um, the music that I write wrote um, sort of, I felt really like attached to it. And I felt that I wanted to tell more on pu purely musical terms. And so a decade later, I decided to grab one of the pieces from that original documentary score that I had particularly loved through the years and expand on it. And the mm -hmm. rest of the Lost Birds was born from that process. And if you're curious, the original piece from that documentary score is actually the overture to the mm -hmm. Lost Birds. He's called Flocks a Mile Wide. Right, right, right. Um, it's such an ambitious project. I mean, it's not just about the music. There's also uh, a social media uh, component to the project. And there's even visualizers like if you go to youtube and like put in christopher tan lost birds you'll see these visualizers that were created for the project and judging by the stuff that i got from crossover media there were some very clear plans and goals built around the project can you talk about your reasoning and thinking behind that a bit well i mean we wanted to of course um you know highlight the issue and and bring it to the public's attention um but um, you know, the piece itself sits uh, sort of as a partner piece to the original sculptures that Todd McRain made, as well as the film that that the, uh, the that was made around Todd's, um, you know, process as well. Um, so, yes, I mean, with all things, you know, related to the release by a major record label, you know, yes, there's different marketing angles, you know, there's different different stories that are being told around the project. Um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, and as you know, having, you know, having had the chance to chat together uh, in the past, I like to infuse my music with lots of different layers of meaning and reference and so forth. And so the, the choral texts that are being sung by the ensemble, um, they're all based on poetry from the era of the late 19th century, it's sort of the height of romanticism, but also the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we first really started reshaping the world around us with industry. And that was a really interesting time period to set this project in. Um, mm. It created the right musical language that conveyed the emotion of losing these bird species. Mm -hmm. uh, the four poets are Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, Christina Rossetti, Edna St. Vincent Millay, am I saying that right? And uh, Sarah Teasdale. 
where did you find the poetry uh, and how did you choose which poems you were going to use? Um, so one thing that people don't know about me is I was actually an English major in college. I was an English music double major, so I'm, I'm reasonably well read. Um, <laughs> Sarah Teasdale, um, particularly her poem, There Will Come Soft Rains, has been one of my favorite poems all my life, actually. Uh, Christina Rossetti and Emily Dickinson as well are just, you know, huge, huge uh, poets um, and uh, two of my other favorite poets, honestly. Edna St. Vincent Millay, I knew some of her writings, but um, I had to dig a little deeper to find works that she wrote about birds. And not just about birds, but birds <clears throat> metaphorically representing other things as well. But the great thing about all these women poets is that, um, you know, they were writing in an era of lyrical poetry where birds had a lot of significance within their poetry, as uh, symbolically, for example. Mm. And so it, it, was, it was just really great to sort of mine their catalogs for things that they wrote about birds and about sort of loss as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the oratorio Shiver to Sky, Lost Birds is more melancholy, much more pastoral, and it makes use of just uh, string orchestra and uh, voices. What was your reason, uh, what is your reasoning to pairing things back to this more intimate sounding ensemble? Well, I think the story itself does not lend itself to enormous forces in the same ways that some of my, my previous works did. Uh, there is sort of a uniformity of sound in the world that I was going for this one. The others are very sort of um, uh, very colorful. A lot of different instruments are brought in, a lot of different singers and choirs. With this one, there was a very clear message that needed to be delivered and a story that needed to be told. And um, by using an ensemble like Voce's Eight, which has an unearthly blend to them and pairing them with a very sort of stripped down sound of a string orchestra, I was able to create something that was sort of like more sort of serious in a way or, or more definitely more melancholy, as you mentioned. Um, and, and I find in many ways more of an emotional experience. Uh, the album was recorded at Abbey Road Studios uh, with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and Voces 8. What was it like recording with these two phenomenal ensembles. Oh, fantastic. I mean, I've recorded many times with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, so I knew what they brought to the table. With Voces 8, what was amazing about them is that they have such an attention to detail. I mean, a lot of the recordings that you hear basically on this record are just unadulterated in a way. There's, there's no tuning or anything. It's just what they sang. And yeah. they're such consummate perfectionists that they just do it over and over again until they get it right. And I mean, as a person who also produces his own recordings, it, it was a joy working with them because they self-produce, like they sing a take and then they say, okay, I could have done that better. This was a little sharp. This was a little flat. Maybe we can lock this chord together better. You just sort of sit back and let them do their magical thing. And it's amazing. And I trusted them and I loved working with them so much that I actually reinvented my recording process around their process. Early on, we determined that the best way to get the best result out of them was not to have them sing to an orchestra that's already been recorded, but instead to let them sing the vocal parts on their own without any sort of reference, and then map the orchestra around their recorded performance later oh. on. And that's a complete reversal of the way things are usually done. In almost every other situation, you record the instrumentals first, and then the singers sing on top of the instrumentals. In this right. case, we reversed it. Yeah, we play them uh, here on the station all the time. And I've actually interviewed a, a couple of the members. And like I, I've always just wondered how they work. Because you're right, not only is the blend perfect, the intonation is immaculate. Like just chords that are just shine because they're so perfectly in tune. It's it's really something to hear, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other interesting things that I found out about the, uh, the album, The uh, Lost Birds, is again... You crowdfunded it and you broke your record again. Can you talk about how that works? Like you must have a pretty serious social media following in order to have that happen. I actually don't have much of a social media following. My my <laughs> my follower size pales in comparison to many of my friends. I just happen to have a lot of passionate fans who have been with me on this, this journey for many years and who just want to make sure that the next Christopher Tin piece gets out into the world. Um, and so I'm very blessed in that regard that, uh, you know, when I put the call out to my my fan base that they they all respond and, and help me make these records. I mean, I, I, without 
my Kickstarter supporters, a lot of this music would never come into into the world in a in way that you know everyone can hear it. So I'm in, immensely grateful to Kickstarter for creating the platform and for my fans for for funding all my projects. Yeah, and thank God because it's this Lost Bird CD is just phenomenal. Um, aside from the music that you wrote. Uh, what do you hope people will take away from uh, the recording and where can people go if they want to learn more about the project and possibly help out if they can? Well, you can go to ChristopherTin.com and there's a web page devoted to the project, but also uh, it has some some suggested links for ways to get involved, um, you know, and, and save the birds, so to speak. Um, you know, I hope uh, that um, this helps engender some more conversations about the loss of biodiversity and the reasons for the loss of biodiversity in our world. Um, you know, as we know, we are in precarious times environmentally and, um, you know, day, it seems like every, every week there's some new terrible headline that should scare us into action, but yeah. sadly enough, it doesn't seem to. Um, I think that uh, my take on this and the role of the arts within this greater conversation is that we have to have a multi-pronged approach to motivating people to take issues like this seriously. You know, there are documentary filmmakers who, for example, will create doc great documentaries education, edu educating people about the dangers of climate change. But on the other hand, there are musicians like myself who might create works that appeal on a more emotional level to people and perhaps engender you know, feelings of sympathy or, or concern um, in a, a softer sort of way than a, you know, nuts and bolts documentary might. So it's my hope that people get something out of this that makes them think about the issues a little more and hopefully take action. Yeah, absolutely. Very worthy cause. Chris, again, this has been so much fun to talk to you today about Lost Birds. It is an outstanding set of pieces. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me again. It's been a blast. Likewise, Chris. Great to chat with you.